production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Tonight on Behind the Headlines, an interview we recorded three weeks ago with senior members of the staff of the Greater Memphis Chamber. We recorded this show the morning before Phil Trenary, CEO of the Chamber, was tragically killed. We're airing the episode now to honor the legacy of Phil's work. I'm Eric Barnes, President and Executive Editor of The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by three members of the senior staff from the Memphis Chamber of Commerce. We'll start with Eric Miller, Senior Vice President for Economic Development. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. David McKinney is Senior Vice President for Public Policy. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Ernest Strickland is the Senior Vice President also for Workforce Development. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And Bill Drees is a reporter with The Daily Memphian. So I'll start with Ernest. You're the, the wise old man of this group because you, you didn't just join the chamber. These other two, two men have just joined very recently. Um, and for each of you, though, I'll have the same question to start with the, the Memphis Chamber right now. Economic development is a huge issue in terms of the city role, the county role. There's a lot going on in Memphis and a lot of people wanting a lot more to go on in Memphis. You handle workforce development uh, for the chamber. Talk about your number one or number one, two and three goals for workforce within the realm that you can control. So workforce development is one of the leading uh, factors when companies decide whether or not they're going to relocate or expand. Uh, from the Chamber's standpoint, we view workforce as a way for us to engage with our companies to find out what their primary needs are, what their demands are, and translate that information to our workforce partners so that they can train individuals, find individuals that can fit those needs, and have a healthy, happy uh, Memphis workforce. But it, there are a lot of you know questions. We'll talk about this from a <coughs> bunch of points of view. But when you talk about workforce, people you've heard city council people, other sort of advocates saying, you know, stop candidates for mayor in the last cycle. That we Memphis, they will say, don't need more low wage jobs, more distribution jobs. You hear other people. And we've had them on the show, commercial real estate people, and so on, saying, look, those are still jobs and those are the companies that are coming. How do you balance that in terms of a prepared workforce? You know, everyone wants the highest paying jobs, the high tech jobs, and so on, but sometimes the company that's looking to come, in, to, come to Memphis is a lower wage, lower skill job. How do you balance that? Well, we look to recruit good paying jobs, and we look to upskill our individuals so that they can have marketability to be able to land in those good paying jobs. Um, industry, will find the market that is conducive for that company uh, being successful. We market ourselves to those companies uh, that are able to come in and build um, and find individuals that can um, go to work. And so we balance it with really just looking at what our skill sets are as a community, how attractive we are, and if we want to attract industries that are not here, what do we need to do to be in position to be attractive for those uh, industries. I'll go to you, Eric Miller, Senior Vice President for Economic Development, and you are less than a month into the job, uh, coming from Virginia. Correct. Um, <coughs> so you have a different perspective. You have a perspective of maybe other markets. There's so much debate here, and, and sometimes I think people think it's a debate that only happens here mm -hmm. about what is the right way to recruit businesses to Memphis, what is the role of incentives? What's mm -hmm. your perspective, again, coming from the outside and how other markets handle it and what you saw in Memphis uh, as you looked at the job and then took the job? Again, thank you for having me. Uh, I think the, the right approach, certainly my perspective that's been shaped over my 17 years in this business, doing economic development at the state, regional and local level in four different states, as the most successful programs in the cities and communities that have been most successful in their the, both their job attraction and investment promotion uh, piece as well as uh, the existing industry piece, which, whereby, by the way, you know, existing industries where most communities experience their most significant increase in both capital investment and job creation. So it's very important that we create an environment nur that, that nurtures our existing industry base because that's where most of the new job creation and capital investment is, is catalyzed 
and quite frankly, existing industries serve as our best salespersons to new companies when they're evaluating this market for whether or not they want to come here. So uh, I just want to add that in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the in the press, you know, it's you know, articles about me have referred to my approach being data driven, uh, and all that simply in simplistic terms, what that means is communities have to play to their strengths in a way that you can uh, empiric empirically evidence and use those that, that those data points to create a value proposition that companies understand uh, when you go speak to the companies or when you go speak to site location consultants, making a case for Memphis being the location for their company. So it's it's not it's not anecdotal. It's it's why the, the workforce could work for a particular company that needs a certain abundance of skill, level of skill, and a sustainable pipeline of that skill. It, it, it demonstrates to a company that from a cost standpoint, uh, the various factors they will, uh, that they will evaluate, in, including labor costs, operating costs, ongoing costs, uh, are competitive with other markets in the country. So that's, so that's really the proposition that you're putting in front of companies uh, relative to whatever your competition is for what, whatever that opportunity is. All right, Ooh, and we'll come back to a bunch of those points and kind of break them down, but let me get David McKinney involved. Yep. Um, you are from Memphis, but new to the chamber in a public policy job. Yes. Um, so that means working with, I think, you know, local bodies, city, county, and so on, government, yes. but also advocating at the state legislature. State and federal level. State and federal level. So with public policy, our focus is going to be on advocating for those policies that further strengthen economic growth and development growth development and competitiveness here in our community in Memphis and Shelby County. And really from a broader sense, we look at economic development in the ecosystem. So uh, not only recruiting and retaining jobs, which has gotten a lot of credit, growing our existing businesses, small businesses, and even further with respect to education, workforce development, which is paramount here, uh, uh, transit, transportation, and so many other things when we talk about uh, economic development and even policies, we're talking about public policies, laws, regulations, ordinances, so many things go into that discussion as well. Uh, I would imagine that we'll spend most of the time with respect to the public policy team focusing on local issues uh, the, in the state and federal. And really you look at our sphere of influence in that regard. I think we've got uh, tremendous opportunities to address some of the local policies, uh, public policies that we have here and then at the state level and, 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 and uh, I guess if I put it uh, a priority as far as our influence, there would be at the federal level. Okay, Bill. Um, Eric, you're also part of a city ad hoc mm -hmm. uh, committee that is looking at our economic development framework and, and a lot of discussion about EDGE and the, the, as well as the Greater Memphis Chamber mm -hmm. In, in all of this and the relationship between those, those, those two entities. Where do you see that work going forward? You all have had two meetings and you're still kind of trying to wrap your head around a lot of concepts that are out there. And so you, you're correct, that process is still evolving. Ultimately, why I, you know, why I see it going is a, a, a consolidated process entity uh, that's more solution oriented and customer friendly and creates the right persona for Memphis in the marketplace of companies looking to relocate in Memphis and Shelby County. I mean, the, the, the ultimate goal of that, that committee is to make uh, Memphis and Shelby County, this entire community, uh, uh, more f perceived more favorably in the eyes of decision makers when they're contemplating locating the operations here. Quite frankly, that's in terms of, of edge, in its processes, um, that's just simply not the case right now. So the onus is on us as stewards of the best interests of this, this community to improve that process so that we improve our chances of creating well-paying jobs and, and, a and a future vision for the citizens in this area. And so in the big picture, that's why I ultimately think Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, not what, that's where we're going with that. Uh, what the outcome is is yet to be determined. Right. Yeah. And, and when you talk about consolidation, one of the examples of that that came up at this week's meeting of the group was what's happening in Charlotte, mm -hmm. where their Chamber of Commerce has effectively consolidated with what they call the regional <coughs> authority mm -hmm. there, which is roughly their equivalent of, of our edge. Not, that's not so. Okay. So I'm originally from South Carolina. Okay and uh, worked at the Department of Commerce in the early parts of my career. It's how I got in this business. And so I worked with the Charlotte Regional Partnership uh, for a number of years. Uh, still very good friends with its current CEO and those several members on the board, uh, and in fact lived in Charlotte at some point. So 
the parallel couldn't be more different between EDGE and the Charlotte Regional Partnership, and I'll just outline a couple of ways. One, the Charlotte Regional Partnership is a regional partnership and it's a public-private entity that represents 16 counties and has a bi-state cover. So they, they, the Charlotte Regional Partnership works with co counties in, in South Carolina as well as in that Charlotte region. Uh, secondly, it's, public, it's publicly funded but also privately funded. Third, its CEO reports to a board and not to mayors or any sort of head of any government, of uh, uh, municipal or county government. Uh, and, and the fourth point is it doesn't have any authority to levy, promulgate, negotiate, or make any sort of binding representations as it relates to incentives. So it couldn't be more different than EDGE. Okay. In essence, it's really a lead generation marketing entity for that region. Um, the, the, the municipalities and the counties, well, don't uh, contribute based on a per capita form, I think it is. And then the business sector also uh, contributes to the funding of that organization. Um, it's not nearly uh, as robust as it once was because the state of North Carolina uh, made a, the, the, the policymakers made a decision to privatize economic development and created a c completely private firm that's not only funded by the state but also funded by private sector companies in North Carolina, which in turn created a, a tap the resources for the Charlotte Regional Partnership because the partnership and the chamber and now the statewide entity all call on the same big corporate benefactors to help fund operations. So that's some of the impetus for the consolidation you see as well as some the blurring of lines and the mission for the Charlotte Chamber which is centrally focused on just Charlotte and the mission of the Charlotte Regions Chamber which is to, to serve a region. So they really functionally couldn't be more different. Okay, so is there something in that model that could be applied here, that should be applied here? Yeah, a recognition that the, the, the murkiness of the message from, the, uh, from that area uh, doesn't serve the interests of what they're trying to achieve, and that's economic prosperity for the region and the citizens that reside in it. Okay. Yes. Um, Ernest, in terms of workforce development, th this has been a long discussion that, that we've had, probably grew more intense when Mitsubishi and Electrolux came here and, and some other entities that, that are corporations that, that, that came here. Where do you think we are in terms of workforce development? We've obviously recognized the problem, but, but are, are, are we making progress on that? And you mentioned the problem, and nationally, we have a skills gap. Um, as a country, we decided that we were going to not train vocationally as we had in years prior. We were more on a every child, college-bound type of system. And so that today produces itself as skills gaps in local communities such as Memphis. Uh, we have recognized that, and we see that there's a pivot from our Shelby County school system, our municipal systems. They're all moving more towards those career and technical training. Uh, that is something that we're going to benefit from in, in the near future. Uh, now, we're seeing our local um, workforce uh, investment network uh, be more uh, sensitive to getting individual training grants so that they can upskill themselves and be more marketable uh, that helps the individual achieve those high-paying jobs, and it helps us as a community showcase to companies that are looking here and looking to expand that we are on top of finding and supporting a quality workforce. Uh, I'm excited about uh, the direction that we're going. Uh, Eric mentioned, and you mentioned consolidation. We're seeing some alignment uh, take place within uh, the workforce space, alignment that's needed. Uh, for instance, you, you have the chamber. Our goal is to be the leading uh, entity and national benchmark uh, for workforce development. We want other communities to see what we're doing and model from us. That is primarily why I'm in this role. The chamber decided to elevate workforce um, from previous years, and uh, now we're moving forward with uh, conversations with other organizations that have workforce activities and we're saying hey how can we work together how can we define clear lanes um, obviously the chamber has a uh, huge uh, benefit and close connection to companies well who has that close connection to uh, the job seekers how can we support uh, those organizations who's focused on developing the pipeline and making sure that what is being taught is 
leading towards what's in demand from industries. And so I'm excited about the direction uh, we're talking. Uh, there's new leadership in place. I think it's focused on uh, making sure that workforce is a priority. And so if, if Memphis was a public traded company, I would buy all the stock that we can afford. <laughs> all right. I'll double down on that. <laughs> okay. and, and, and David, uh, I, I was at a town hall meeting that, that several city council members had in Hickory Hill uh, a, a week or two ago now. And, and you talked about uh, our approach in terms of public policy and that, that, that basically economic development is something where business should, should lead in, in, in that regard, as opposed to the elected officials who are obviously a part of it. Correct. But, but you, you feel like this is something for business to lead. Yeah, and, and that town hall was in Hickory Hill, hosted by Councilwoman Patrice Robinson back in my old stomping grounds, graduate of Wooddale High School mm -hmm. uh, there. And public policy, if you look about it, very definition in uh, with the respect to the chamber and just in general, uh, it, it lends itself to collaboration. Uh, there has to be a collaborative environment between government and business, business community, and the chamber being the leading voice for the business community. And with respect to job creation, the business community uh, is a leading vehicle in creating those jobs. With respect to the government, the government creates the environment for which those jobs can be created. You can't have one necessarily without the other. And I think that's, that's really a, a key point of distinction, especially when we start talking about our ability to be competitive. Uh, the, the thing about it is uh, good public policy uh, should necessarily make us more competitive. And the fact that policy and, and, and being competitive is, are, are not mutually exclusive propositions. What, what does it mean then from a government point of view, uh, state, local yeah. level, to be, quote, business friendly? I mean, and what are those impediments when companies are coming in to, or, or right. a company that exists here, as Eric was pointing out, it wants to expand? So I'll give you a couple of examples. One example uh, to be business friendly, and, and I look at it in a more global sense, is much of the state effort that we've done to, to really bolster our stakehold in education, which certainly goes right in hand with the work that Ernest Strickland is doing in workforce development with our drive to 55, with our ability to uh, uh, send uh, uh, young people and adults to college, community colleges, TCATs, to better prepare them, to align them with the type of skills that they need to be competitive in this workforce. So that's one thing, certainly at, at the state level. Another thing is something that, that we talk about a lot is adding additional resources and tools in the toolbox. So take the community resurgence tax credit, something that we're likely going to be working on. We're in the process of uh, finalizing our legislative agenda, our state legislative agenda, but something we'll be looking at. And that's something that's going to be geared to creating jobs in uh, historically disinvested communities. We have a lot of those in Memphis. We want to make sure that we have all the resources that we can from the state level and at the local level to make sure that we can, we can land those good paying jobs and create those good paying jobs in those areas. So that's just two policy examples. Eric, from your point of view, again, just taking advantage of your outside perspective, being new to Memphis, um, the incentive game that gets so much criticism here and so much discussion among politicians, citizens, business leaders, um, are there communities out there that don't rely heavily on tax incentives in terms of retaining and recruiting business? Um, not in my experience, no. Um, and I, I understand the angst about incentives. In some respects, I think uh, the, the incentive the incentive discussion is weighted far too heavily in terms of what the, the, the gestation period for projects. A great incentive never made a bad site good. Never, you know, didn't instantly create a workforce where there was none, or a workforce that had the requisite skill sets such that it wouldn't have an adverse impact on the timeline for a company to get in operation. But Incentives are, if you want to call them, if for those who consider them the bane of our existence, they are a necessary bane. They're in a single community in this country that's going to be a catalyst for a paradigm shift in the way that economic development is practiced right now in, in, the, in the retention or attraction space, and that very much includes the utilization of incentives. The fact of the matter is, you know, if you don't utilize incentives as a, a, a comprehensive approach to recruiting or retaining industries, other communities will, and so you will effectively just taking yourself out of the game, i.e. you will not be competitive for opportunities. 
And you, when you were talking earlier about the Charlotte and, and mm-hmm. the, the crossing of borders in mm-hmm. North and South Carolina, mm-hmm. I couldn't help but think about Memphis relative to Mississippi and to mm-hmm. DeSoto County and, mm-hmm. and other counties in Mississippi, Marshall County, mm-hmm. that have done a great job mm-hmm. from, of, of getting businesses to locate there, in mm-hmm. some cases to locate across the border from mm-hmm. Memphis, but then to take advantage of, say, the Memphis airport, mm-hmm. the Grizzlies, the, mm-hmm. the amenities of a big city mm-hmm. north of their border, sure. when they have a different sort of tax incentive structure <clears throat> and some would argue lower taxes. Mm-hmm. How do you, when you looked at Memphis and, and decided to take the job, how do you look at that competition with DeSoto County? And then when you have commercial real estate people who've been on the show and talked about it, who've said, look, we market the region. Wherever that distribution center lands, it's still jobs for the region. Mm-hmm. They are less concerned about the, the, the issue of the border. So, and so are companies who would look at our region. The, um, the, only, the only folks who see these borders it's all internal to the market. Companies couldn't care less. You know, for them, it's where is the best site, where can they draw the labor from, and you know, people drive back and forth across, to your point, you know, the, the, the labor shed, this population drives back and forth across those, the borders to, for job opportunities every day. So I embrace re- regionalism. I was steeped in it in, in all of my profession, so I believe in regionalism. It, in my opinion, it enhances our ability to be competitive for opportunities. You know, it, it broadens our opportunities. Uh, and so there, you know, there are examples of cross-border uh, cooperation. Obviously, you know, from a marketing and lead generation standpoint, the Charlotte Regional Partnership is one example. The, another example exists in, in, in Kansas City. Um, so there, there are ways to do that through in, uh, intergovernmental opera- operating agreements or MOUs between the entities such that, uh, let's just say, for example, we collaborate with a cross-border community to co-develop a site and agreed to, to, to share revenues, tax revenues generated from that site, you know, uh, between those two, two communities. That's a win-win situation in my mind. Yeah, okay, D- a few minutes left, Bill. All right, and, and uh, Ernest, that there is uh, quite a discussion, uh, or has been quite a discussion about uh, for-profit schools that could provide job training versus the, 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 the training and associate degrees that are offered by our community colleges in, in the state. And from the governor's race, I remember Randy Boyd saying this in the Republican primary, that the ratio of students who attend community colleges and those who attend the for-profit schools is a majority of students attending the community colleges in every part of the state except for Memphis, where it's kind of reversed in that regard. Is that something that, that concerns you or, or is that just the way that that students pick where they where they want to go in this market well we want there to be uh, schools that are excellent at what they uh, teach we want those training opportunities to be customized to industry needs uh, it creates some competition competition can be good we see our local um, southwest for instance they have really um, stepped up their game they hired an individual from the chamber, which created uh, some forced alignment. We're seeing private schools like More Tech be creative with the automotive uh, training program that they've put in place because of the demand that is in this particular market. So we, pr- we support uh, both entities moving forward with excellent programs. Mm-hmm. Do, does career and technical education, does it have what some have called a, a, a stigma to it or or should it be regarded differently than maybe we've regarded it in the last decade or so? Yeah, it, it should. It should be um, promoted as here's a way to advance in life through great high paying jobs so that you can have an opportunity for yourselves and your families. Uh, we don't have to promote it as the old factory jobs of the past. If you go into one of these manufacturing plants today, it's very high tech. Um, Coming up October 5th, we have National Manufacturing Day. We're gonna take uh, 15 high schools into local plants and facilities so that they can see what today's um, automated manufacturing looks like and learn more about how they can gain skills and matriculate into those careers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eric, h- how much do you hear in your experience about workforce development when a client comes in or a site consultant comes in? So, great question. So, two weeks ago, 
I'm at a site selector, site se it's, there's an organization called the Site Selectors Guild. It's comprised of some of the preeminent site selection consultants globally. Uh, they held their fall conference in Greenville, South Carolina, which happens to be the epicenter of uh, man, you know, foreign and domestic investment in this country. I mean, it's, well, South Carolina's just blowing it up. But I've, my, my reach in that sector is both broad and deep, just given the fact that I've been in this business for a while. The first three site selectors who also happen to be friends of mine, whose paths I crossed, and not collectively, all individually, they said the same thing. Congratulations on a new opportunity. What are you going to do about your workforce? What are you going to do about your process, i.e. edge? And what are you going to do about the paucity of available in, uh, greenfield sites and buildings? That's what they all say. Greenfield sites and buildings, what, what does that mean? <coughs> so, that. so, very brief. yes, development ready sites, that, that, these are sites that have been cleared, uh, graded, infrastructure is in place, or it has been designed, engineered, scheduled, and funding source in place such that you can give some certainty to a company as to whether when it will be prepared, ready relative to their timeline for being in operation. And available buildings are both industrial and office space. Yeah, more industrial space than office space, quite frankly, but they ask about both. And, and does that counter to things like the Firestone site and some of the Brownfield sites that, that Memphis would like to redevelop and market? And so I think that's an interesting opportunity. Um, the, the, the ability to demonstrate a solution-oriented mentality and taking existing properties and redeveloping them for, for uh, adaptive reuse makes a lot of sense and has a lot of cach cachet in the industry right now. And actually right. that's one of the policies that we're working on at the state level. All right. Well, that is all the time we have. Join us again next week. And thanks.